Welcome to your next challenge entitled Return the Last Element in an Array. The directions are to create a function that accepts an array and returns the last item in the array. The array can contain any of C Sharp's primitive data types. So this is probably new. We haven't talked about an array yet. This is a collection and you can see in the examples below um, they give you a few ideas of how to understand the problem. The problem itself is pretty easy. You'll notice that they just return essentially the last item in the collection. True, true. And so the weird thing kind of going on here that might be confusing you is that the array can be filled with integers, it can be filled with strings, or it can be filled with booleans, right? Normally when we've seen the method parameters, they're very strict. They say int, uh, number of pies, or whatever. And it, it is very strict. If you throw something else in there like a Boolean, the compiler gets angry at you and won't run your program. So you're probably wondering by what sort of magic is the parameter going to be set up to facilitate passing in these different types. And so we're going to have to talk a little bit about polymorphism. Maybe you've heard that word before. It's a very um, important concept in object-oriented programming. This will not be a video about polymorphism. It's a little more involved. We're going to learn just enough to try and get through this problem, or at least even to understand how we can pass all these different types in, since that's against sort of what we've done before. And again, we'll learn about array. The array itself is just a simple collection that holds multiple items. Before we had, say, an integer variable that held one value. With an array, this is a collection, so you can hold many values. In these examples, they unfortunately always used three in the array, but you can set them up to hold whatever number of elements you want. So let's go look over at the code and get a better idea of this. If you are familiar with arrays and this sort of thing, feel free to pause here and, and work out your solution. Otherwise, we'll start with how the magic occurs. And you'll notice that the parameter is an object array. These square braces at the end make it an array. If they weren't present, it would just be a single object, sort of like we had a single int or a single string. But since this is here, we know an array is com coming in. This permits arrays of any size. So the reason object works, you can think of object as sort of a basis for all things, for lack of a better word, in C sharp. Think of the primitive types we use, integers, uh, strings, and booleans. They all sort of are built upon this idea that they're objects and the system can work with them because they kind of have this underlying uniform characteristic where they know how to deal with these. If you'd like to learn more, you can look up the object class in the Microsoft documents, but the important part is this is the ultimate base class of all .NET classes, so all the things that we're working with are objects and that's essentially all you need to know to understand why this object array can be filled with an integer array, a string array, etc. And notice the corresponding return type is object so we can also return a single integer, a single string as necessary. We don't necessarily know right now what the user of this method will pass in. They might pass an integer. If we just call it an object, we can return it as an object and there is no problem. So the, th the next thing to understand is what an array is. And I found a simple picture that I hope illustrates this for you. So the top rectangle here would represent the array itself and it's populated with all these values. All these little boxes are kind of subdivisions of the larger rectangle that store all of the elements that are stored inside. You can think of it as holding many values. We'll say integers here. 
because that's what this example uses. These 7, 11, 6, these are all made up values. You put any number in there that you like. Now, the rectangle below alongside of it is not a separate array. They're just trying to show you the corresponding index value of how you access these elements. So if you wanted this first element of 7, you would access it by the indexer 0, and it would return you 7. If you wanted the value 98, you would select the fourth uh, index of 4, not the fourth entry. That would be the fifth entry and so on. You can say you want the third entry and it, you'll get six. The, the important thing to know here is that notice the indexing starts from zero instead of one and this is very common in computer science. It's uh, an adopted practice. So the result of this is that the final element index is actually one less than the count of elements. So if you count up all these boxes, you'll see there's nine of them. And if you want the ninth element, you actually access it with the number eight. Or to say this more generally, if an array holds n elements, you would access the last element by n minus one. So knowing that, um, we know we're going to have to go one less than the count. The next question is, how do we get the size of the array? And if you thought of the Microsoft documents, very good. You're, it's going to be listed there for you. Um, you don't have to read all this right now. They give some nice examples that I like to look at of how to declare and define arrays. Um, you can see in this case the number here corresponds to the size of the array, but later in code the, You'll also index the array with this sort of um, with this code here, or with the the square brackets. Anyway, if we go down to the properties section, we'll see we have a length property, and it gets the total number of elements in all the dimensions of the array. Don't worry about that too much, but you could have a multi-dimensional array. We won't talk about that here. We'll assume one-dimensional array. That's what we're working with. If you want to see even more, you can click on length. And it'll tell you pretty much you're getting an integer back that gets the total number of elements of the array. So that's good. We got this dot length we get to use, right? That'll be the property we invoke. So you can go int last index equals array dot length that gives the size remember we have to do that n minus one so you get last index like that and then you can simply return the array of last index remember I said you use these square braces again and you insert uh, the number index that you want it can also be a variable like I used here otherwise you could type out an actual number like three you just have to make sure you stay within the bounds of the array. Otherwise, you have problems. Um, you can get into trouble, especially in C++, where they'll let you uh, overrun the bounds of the array, and you can actually access and manipulate memory uh, that's used for something completely different. And that is very dangerous, as you can imagine. It causes a lot of weird bugs in your program that are hard to find. So. You typically want to have some kind of protection against overrunning the bounds of an array. Anyway, we did our length minus one. Great. Return array last index. We can check this out to make sure we did it right. Let's go for that happy sign. There it is. Great. Yeah. And so this way was a little wordy, but it's a little easier to see what I was doing. Feel free to be neat and clean, concise. You can put that value right in. Remember, all it needs is an integer value here. Um, and then you can get rid of this temporary variable that you never really needed, but it, it hopefully helps you visualize where that value came from. So uh, that's pretty much all there is for the array for now. 
um, there are many other data structures and we'll compare their benefits, their disadvantages to try and figure out when each is appropriate for a given situation. And the other thing to note would be this probably weird object thing right now that's wishy-washy and can kind of take anything. To maybe help visualize that a little bit more, again, you don't have to take anything away here, but to understand, I found a simple diagram showing basic polymorphism, and their example is shapes. So you can see they have a base class, and then it is extended into these actual shapes. This is shape itself is kind of like an abstract concept, and then you have these concrete implementations of shape, triangle, rectangle, circle. And if you're wondering why anyone would do this, you can see that regardless of shape um, in your system, you may have a need to draw a shape, you know? Any shape can be drawn. You don't really care what kind of shape it is if you're the the responsible for displaying an image of it. You know, you just you just want to draw it. All shapes will be drawn. Another example may be um, calculating the area of a shape. You know, that can be determined for any shape. But each shape itself goes about it very differently. So you can't say how to do it here. You know, a triangle would be base times height over 2, rectangle would be length times width, and circle would be pi r squared. So you can't say at this level how to actually do the thing, just like drawing. You know, you can't say here because it could be round, it could be a box, could only have three sides. You don't know yet. And you, you fill out the details in the downstream extended classes as it makes sense. And what you get out of this is that then you can just have a collection of shapes and just call draw on them. And you don't have to care about whether one's a triangle, a rectangle, how they actually draw, how they actually um, calculate area. It's nice if you're running a part of the system that just doesn't need to know anything about it, doesn't need any sort of connection to that, where you need to change what you do when they change what they do. It's, it's a nice decoupling mechanism there. And so to kind of put this in the perspective of what we did, you can think of this shape class as being like object, and then these classes being like integer, boolean, string, etc. There'd be a bunch of other types too. So um, hopefully that was more help than confusion. Uh, don't beat yourself up. Remember the strategy here is to just talk about things, um, retain what you do, uh, remember what you do and just don't stress it. Go with the flow and as usual, ask questions below. Thanks.